Well, today's message is called Everyone Save One. Say that with me, everyone save one. Now, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. <clears throat> now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And I love the message translation. I'm going to read it. Uh, it's, it's quite a cool translation. 2 Corinthians 5, 18. All this comes from God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. How, you ask? In Christ. God put the wrong on him who did nothing who did anything wrong so we could be right with God. Amen. So the first point I want to make today is God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.18 as we read, Now all things are of God who has. Notice has, the deal is done. Who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace we have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Isn't it the most incredible feeling walking around knowing your sins are forgiven? Not based on anything we can do, but based on what Jesus has already done on the cross. That's why the Bible says it's by grace that we are saved. We are not trusting in our good works to get us to heaven. We are trusting in what Jesus did on the cross. Amen. Ephesians 10, 13, for whoever, we are the whosoevers. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I called on the name of Jesus when I was a 20-year-old Jewish boy. I say, Jesus, I believe you, the Son of God. I give my life to you. I trust in you. I believe that you died for me. And the moment I prayed that prayer, something amazing happened. I was born again. I went from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. My name was written in the Lamb's book of life. There was a great party in heaven because the Bible says there's great joy in heaven over one person that repents. And there is a moment of salvation. Some churches, some denominations, some move movements say, no, there isn't an exact moment of salvation. You have to follow the teachings of Christ. You, no, that's not what the Bible says. Jesus said, if you, unless you are born again, you won't even see the kingdom of God. It's impossible to follow God, follow Jesus, to have a passionate desire to read his word, unless you are first born again. So there is an exact moment of time when you say, Jesus, I give my life to you, save me. Your spirit that was dead to God is now born again. It's alive. So when you read the word of God, everything from then on will make sense. Before it was like reading a telephone directory, boring. But when you, you are 
given your life to Jesus and you start to read the Word of God, it, it's an exciting book. It's life. So let us make this one declaration, and it's a true declaration. It's not an arrogant declaration. The declaration is, there is only one Savior between heaven and earth, and His name is Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The second point I want to make today is, we are ambassadors for Christ. I looked up the, 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 the Merriam-Webster's dictionary meaning of ambassador and I really got excited. Listen to what it says. A diplomatic agent. I like that. Uh, how many of you, let's be real, like you watch James Bond, Jason Bourne. It's like, I want to be like that. Well, you can be like that, being an ambassador of Christ. A diplomatic agent. <laughs> of the highest rank. Yes, sir. Accredited to a foreign government or sovereign as the resident representative of his or her own government or sovereign or appointed for a special and often temporary temporary diplomatic assignment. We are ambassadors for God. We are ambassadors of the kingdom of God. We are on loan from heaven here on earth. And God has a special assignment for you generally. And he has a specific assignment for you. You need to get your marching orders from the president, from God himself, to find out what he wants you to do. But one of the things he wants you to do, he wants to use you to preach the gospel. And it's so great being an ambassador because being an ambassador means you have the backing of your nation. If you're an ambassador of America in a foreign country, you've got the Navy, the Air Force, the police, the Navy SEALs, the Special Forces, all the, the weaponry backing you up. If anything happened to you in that country, America would back you 100% to get you out of there or, or do whatever. And when you are an ambassador of a country, when you are in that country, it's as if the president of America himself is there. You are a representative of that country. You are a representative of heaven. You can't just talk what you want to talk. You need to find out what the president of your country wants. And when you go into all meetings, you have a directive. You have authority. You have power. You have backing. And you are a representative and ambassador of Jesus Christ on earth. And God is backing you up. With miracles, signs and wonders. With power, with authority, with favor. All the resources you need, He's backing you up. Now how do we access that? We access those things by faith. Because the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. The Bible says those that come to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. If your embassy is under attack, you pick up that red phone, we need your help. You know help is on its way. When you're on earth and you have an assignment, from the Lord to reach your next door neighbor, to reach your community, to reach your city, to reach your nation, to be a businessman, a businesswoman, a scientist, whatever your calling is, all you need to do is pick up the phone and speak to God and He will back you up 100%. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ. The moment you gave your life to Jesus, bam, you became an ambassador of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2 verses 4 says, But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, 
even so we speak not as pleasing to men, but God who tests our heart. One of the great things that God has entrusted to us as his children and as his ambassadors is to preach the gospel. Is to let people know that he loves them. And he wants to have a relationship with them. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Do you believe that? But then Jesus does something great. He gives us delegated authority. He says then, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you and I, I'm with you always. When you have that revelation that Jesus is with you, you will think differently. You won't have a small mentality. You'll have a big mentality. When someone says, oh, I've got cancer. I don't know what I'm going to do. You know what you're going to do. You're going to do what the word says, what the ambassador would do, which is lay your hands on the sick and they will recover. Or if someone is oppressed or demon-possessed, you will pray for them. If demons need to be cast out, you'll cast them out. You'll lay your hands on the sick, they will recover. I like what someone said, I think it was Spurgeon, if God has called you to preach, don't lower yourself to be the king of England. And what's so great is God has called all of his children to share the gospel it's a mighty calling it's a mighty privilege the word here says we've all been given that ministry no one is exempt point number three is he has given us the word 2 corinthians 5 verse 18 has given us the ministry of reconciliation in verse 19, it says, committed to us the word of reconciliation. So we have a kingdom responsibility to reconcile people to God. How do we reconcile them to God? We tell them about him. One, sorry, Romans chapter 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation. You want to see the power of God in operation? Start to tell someone about Jesus. And many times you will see people being transformed before your very eyes. And, and when you lead your first person to Jesus, it is the greatest feeling. It's actually, I, I think I felt better having led someone to Jesus than them, themselves receiving Jesus. And you can't believe, like, you say, are you sure you want to receive Jesus? Yes, I want to receive Jesus. It's like, wow, Lord, this works. And then you can't wait to share it again and again and again. And sharing the gospel is such an amazing thing because you are bringing life to people. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. The word of God is a chain breaker. Now, whatever you want to see manifest, you need to speak about. If you want to see someone healed, you've got to speak about healing. If you want to see someone come to know Jesus, you've got to speak about Jesus. You've got to speak about salvation because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So the more we speak the word of God, the more faith arises in people and people begin to have trust in God. Trust in God that they can be saved. Trust in God that they can be healed. And trust in God that they can be delivered from their situation. <coughs> and point number four, my final point my wife is looking at me probably saying, amen. She always tells me when I preach too long, I said, she said, don't preach too long today. I said, oh, I feel that preaching anointing on me. 
I think I'm going to go a whole hour. <coughs> but I'm, I won't. The, what did they say? Uh, blessed are the short-winded, they will be invited back. So even though I'm the pastor of the church, I want to be invited back. So the fourth and final point is we need to preach the gospel. Say preach the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now I looked up the word implore. Implore, what does implore mean? The meaning of the word implore means beg someone earnestly or desperately to do something. I don't want anyone going to hell on my shift. I've made sure quite thoroughly that my Jewish relatives have heard about Jesus. Some of them I've, I've shared the gospel with personally. Some of them are scattered around the world. So I've sent them CDs and DVDs. And when I preached the Passover message, the Easter message last week, guess, we, we, we loaded it on YouTube. Guess what I did? I sent them the link. I said, my dear Jewish, whatever cousin, whoever it is, I shared a, a great message on the evidence proving that Yeshua is our Messiah. I encourage you to watch. I even sent it to, to my cousin's rabbi. I'm sure I'm, sure I'm going to be the talk of the town in, in that community for sure. Guaranteed. What did he say? No, I, I'll send it to you. Did you hear what he said? Send it to me, send it to me. Mark 16 verse 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. I don't want anyone to be condemned. That's why I have a passion to preach the gospel, to reach people. And these signs will follow those who believe. Do you believe? Let me ask you, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? So it's talking about you. These signs will follow, say, follow me. In my name, you will cast out demons. You haven't lived until you've cast out a demon. I, I'm telling you, it's fun. It's fun. I remember a few years ago, we, we brought 31 Orange County Christians to South Africa and they arrived on the Sunday and we started the outreaches on the Monday and Lucinda and I just gently warned them, listen, in every school there are going to be quite a few kids, anything one to five kids, demon possessed. So you're going to have to cast out a few demons and guess what? At the end of the first day, people were loving it. Because it's one thing to hear, but it's another thing to do. When you say, in the name of Jesus, come out of him. <laughs> what happened? And you know that God used you to deliver someone. You feel like a, like a ghostbuster. It's great. When you lay your hands on someone who's sick or crippled or blind or deaf and you say in the name of Jesus be healed and they're healed instantly, it's a great feeling. And you can't wait to do it again. You, you just want to go to the hospital and go from ward to ward because this thing works. Now, some people are healed instantly. Some people are healed gradually. But you know what's so great? In heaven, we are all healed. We all get a glorified body. So the great news, even for Christians that maybe didn't get their healing totally on earth, whether they were crippled or blind or, or had some attack on their life, in heaven, for eternity, you get a glorified body. So even then, we win. They will speak in new tongues. Did he say tongues? I thought that, uh, that's gone. No, that is very much still happening. 
And on Pentecost Sunday, we're going to share about the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. But tongues is a spiritual gift that God gives you where your spirit communes directly with Him. Jesus said, God is a spirit and those that speak to Him must speak to Him in spirit and in truth. So when you speak in your heavenly language, you speak mysteries from your spirit, the real you, directly to God. It will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick. One evangelist, Oral Roberts, who, who saw the most incredible miracles. If you go on YouTube, put in there Oral Roberts miracles, you'll see so many uh, amazing miracles. And, uh, and he said a very profound thing. He said, I heard him say, I've prayed for more people one-on-one -on -one that have been healed in the history of the world. More people have been healed in my ministry praying for them one-on-one -on -one than anyone else. So I, I started to think, wow, that's quite a bold slash arrogant statement. But then he went on to finish the sentence and he said, I've prayed for more people that haven't been healed in the history of the world. So he was basically saying, it's not my job to heal them. It's my job to believe, to lay hands on the sick, and God will heal them. And the same is true with us. Our job is to lay our hands on the sick. His job, Father's job, Jesus' job is to heal them. Some of them will be instantly healed. I love those instant healings. We've seen many of them in our outreaches and crusades. Blind eyes, cripples, deaf people. Uh, just the most incredible miracles. And then some people, if our crusade in Africa would go on three or four days, will even come on the third or fourth day and say, Pastor, you prayed for me three days ago while I was walking today. Something happened, my body's healed. So many people that you're going to pray for in the mall or at school or on the bus or on the airplane, you're going to pray for them. And the healing power of Jesus is going to go into them and they're going to be healed. But I'm sure the same devil that speaks to me speaks to you. What if nothing happens? Or we've lost nothing. When he says that, I think we need to say, what if something does happen? <laughs> gotcha. We've got nothing to lose. But it's intimidating so many times, not just in outreaches. I'll see a crippled person or a blind person, and, and, and sometimes it's a mom who's, who's pushing a kid, and I'll say, hey, how you doing? I'm Jared. I'm, I'm actually a pastor, and can I pray for your child? I don't think I've ever had anyone say no. And you always trust that they're healed instantly. But Jesus is the healer. Don't stop. When someone says, I'm feeling sick, get into that spiritual habit. Can I pray for you? Don't think, oh, what medicine can I recommend? Oh, I've got a great doctor. He does back things. Or, oh, yeah, I've got a great doctor. He's a great ear guy and nose and throat specialist. And, and yes, you may know those people. You may be those people. But let's just say, can I pray for you? And the Bible says these signs will follow you. It doesn't say the pastors, evangelists, prophets, teachers, apostles. It says us, Christians. And it says they will recover. It doesn't say they're going to be instantly healed. Recovery is sometimes instant, gradual, but we're all healed in heaven. Final scripture, I promise. Luke chapter 4 verse 16. I love this one. I love it. Luke 4, 16, and he, that's Jesus, said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those that were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. I can relate to this because sometimes you invite a lot of people. <laughs> 
to supper. Supper is church. You invite a lot of people. As you know, we send out a lot of books, a lot of CDs, a lot of DVDs. Why are we doing this? Because we love people. We want to see them come to Jesus. Amen. The first said to him, oh, and then it says here, but they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of land and I must go and see it. So he bought maybe a nice holiday home. Sorry, I can't come to church. I need to go and, and work on my renovation or, or work on my yacht or do something like that. I ask you to please excuse me. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. Oxen is transportation. I bought five new cars. A Harley Davidson, I bought a, a Jeep, I bought a, a this, I bought a that. And I'm going to test them. I ask you to please excuse me. Still another said, I have married a wife. And that's okay, that's good. And therefore I cannot come. I understand if it's honeymoon. Other than honeymoon, you've got to come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the maimed, and the lame, and the blind. The broke, busted, and disgusted crowd. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. It's like they're not enough. Compel them. Compel them. I quickly looked up the word compel. Merriam Webster Dictionary. To drive or urge forcefully. It's, it's an aggressive. Compel is like quite an pushy. These people are so pushy. Yeah, we just fall in what the Bible says. To cause, to do, or occur by overwhelming pressure. An example is public opinion compelled her to sign the bill. I think we need to compel to sign a bill saying no more abortion. Amen. I think we need, the church needs to do some compelling and we are. It says, I compel them to come in and my house will be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste of my supper. So they are the ones that missed out. So we need to invite people to church. But we also need to reach out and tell people that Jesus loved them. Amen.